So we started this series on Ash Wednesday, and we are talking about things that are self-destructive. This is very appropriate for the season of Lent, because in Lent, it's a time where we focus on sin, on our sins, on our most grievous sins, and the effects that those sins have in our own lives, lives of the people that we love, and even how they affect our community, our neighborhood, our country. Lent is a time where we want to turn away from our sins and turn toward Jesus. Because in every fall, in every failure, we have the hope of the cross. Forgiveness. Complete forgiveness of our sins. Now, things that we use to sabotage ourselves. We, we've talked about doubt. Last Sunday, we talked about lying. Today, we're going to talk about trivia. Does anybody know what board game this is? Thanks for the intro, Karen. Didn't know I was doing that. Life? No, not life. Trivial Pursuit. Yes, yeah, so a few people have played it. It's, I guess it's an old game now. Uh, <clears throat> I find it very ironic or even funny that uh, many times the people who play this game are very intense. I mean, they get very serious. It's very competitive. A trivial pursuit. Trivial, by definition, means that it's not important. <laughs> this, this is not vital. And yet, <laughs> we get so, so caught up in the pursuit of trivial things. What does this have to do with sin? Well, we very easily get our priorities out of order. We start pursuing the trivial things in life and losing focus on the most important things in life. We all tend to make mountains out of molehills. Or how do they say it in the business world? You keep the big things big and the small things small. Easier said than done. Well, that leads us to this Old Testament reading. I love bringing these, what you think are obscure Old Testament stories, uh, into 2018 and just seeing how uh, the human condition has always been the same (laughs) and God's response, His laws, and His love, of course, are always the same yesterday, tomorrow, and forever. So in 2 Chronicles 25, we hear about a king of Judah named Amaziah, and he's 25 years old. That is so young. You know, to be a senator in the United States, you must be at least 30 years old. To be the president of the United States, you must be at least 35 years old. And some would say even that's too young, but the, the idea is that you have to have some length of, of, of life experience. You have to have some uh, life perspective if you are going to be any, have any success in running a nation. But here's Amaziah. He's only 25 years old, and he's king. Now, he did reign for a long time, 29 years. He said, uh, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. Have you ever done anything half-heartedly? Were you ever given a task that you you really didn't want to do? How did that work out? Were you frustrated? Miserable? Did you fail at the task? Amaziah loved the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. We'll say half-heartedly. 
And so there's our first problem. <clears throat> so uh, skip some verses. Um, so Amaziah, king of Judah, he wants to go and attack this city to the south of him called Seir. And he's thinking to himself, well, the more the better. So he's thinking, I'll invite my cousins, Israel, the northern kingdom, to join forces with me and we'll go down together, our armies, and we'll conquer Seir, these evil people. Uh, but uh, God knows something. Amaziah doesn't know. And he helps him out. So this prophet, pastor of the day, uh, Amaziah's pastor uh, goes to him and says, Your Majesty, these troops from Israel must not march with you. For the Lord is not with Israel, not with any of the people of Ephraim. That's another name for Israel. Even if you go and fight courageously in battle, God will overthrow you before the enemy. For God has the power to help or to overthrow. What's going on in Israel at this time is they're not just serving the Lord half-heartedly. They're not serving the Lord at all. They are worshiping idols. They're worshiping golden calves at this point in their history. And God is very concerned. You don't join forces with them. Don't mix, don't mingle, don't corrupt yourself. These people, if you do, there's no way that you're going to win. Now, a little side, because, again, we're in the Old Testament, and one of the interesting questions I hear often is uh, people don't always understand, why is God involved in war? You read the Old Testament, why is it so often God gets involved in battles and bloodshed? And I want to give you a little perspective on this. So why is God involved in human wars? And the first thing is that God has the power to stop unrighteousness. Note, every war, every battle you read in the Old Testament is about righteousness versus unrighteousness. Sin versus righteousness. And it is uh, God and God alone who has the power to help or to overthrow. That's really important for us to remember. When we look at the sin in our world, look at the sin in our nation and grieve over it. When we, during Lent, look in our hearts and see the sin that still clings so tightly to our words and our habits and our thoughts, we don't have the power to overcome it. You can't do it on our own. Only God has the power to help or to overthrow. That, that's your heart. <laughs> that's our nation. It's the world. It's the only hope that any of us and all of us have. God has the power. That's what we learn in Old Testament battles. We also learn that God sometimes uses humans to stop unrighteousness. God works through people. Romans 13 talks about this. The one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoers. God uses people to overcome unrighteousness. And we see that in these battles all the, over the Old Testament. The other thing that we can learn, and this is really important, God is mostly concerned with our unrighteousness. God is more concerned with Amaziah's unrighteousness than he is with conquering the unrighteous city of Seir. First and foremost, he warns Amaziah, don't get entangled, don't get a partnership with the Israelites and, and be tempted into the idolat you know, worship that they are in. You stay far away from them. Your unrighteousness is far more important. God is worried about our unrighteousness, first and foremost. That's why he sent the only hope of the world. Well, Amaziah listens to his pastor... There's a lesson in there somewhere. Um, 
Amaziah listens to his pastor, and he doesn't join forces with Israel. He goes, he leads his own army of Judah, and he goes to Seir, and he conquers Seir. And God gives him the victory over his enemies. But then, verse 14, Amaziah brought back the gods of the people of Seir. He set them up as his own gods, bowed down to them, and burnt sacrifices to them. Now, now let's, let's review. King Amaziah wants to go conquer Seir. God, concerned about his spiritual well-being, says, stay away from your cousins, Israelites, they're worshiping false gods. There'll be a bad influence on you. He says, okay, he heeds God's warning. He goes, God gives him the victory. And then he brings back with him the gods of the people who weren't able to protect the people from the God, his God who defeated them, brought their gods back, set them up in Jerusalem, bowed down to them and worshiped them and uh, uh, sacrificed to them. Now that has got to be the definition of stupid. What in the world? Amaziah had a relationship with the creator of the heavens and the earth. He prayed he could speak to the creator and the creator sent messengers to speak his word to, to him. And he turns around and he worships gods of wood and metal. It's got to be the definition of stupid. Thank goodness we don't have that problem. Right? Trivia. Somebody write this down. Idolatry. Taking the most trivial things in the world and making them the most important thing in your life. Get your priorities out of order. Idolatry. Status. Fame. What other people think of us. For some... This is a big deal. Now, when you grow up, as funny looking as I am, you don't worry about what other people think of you. You get used to it. Other people, this is a big deal. Money. I believe wholeheartedly that the number one false god of America is money. I think we're completely obsessed with it. I think even people who want to be famous, they really want to be famous so they can be rich. People who want a, a great education so they can get a great job so they can be rich. I really think it's the number one false god. And of course, sexuality. The lusts, the passions that we all as humans have Temptations are so strong. Also very, very, very strong temptations. Now, here's the thing. None, none of those things are bad. In and of themselves, they're actually all gifts from God. Right? But when we put them in the place of God as the most important thing in our life, if that's what we are pursuing, trivial pursuit, that's when it becomes idolatry. So I want to talk to you about misplaced things, misplaced priorities. What we can learn from Amaziah, firstly, is that it is easy to do. It is so easy to misplace our priorities. Satan, the devil, he has been at this 
for millennia. And he knows the human condition. And he knows our temptations. He has laid traps and snares and taken down the greatest to the least of the people that we could think of. Secondly, it's, it's easy to do because we are surrounded by people who have all of their priorities out of order. The important things are down here. The trivial things are way up here. That, that's the world we live in. Surrounded by people like that. So it's very, very easy to do. Think of Amaziah. He actually avoided uh, idolatry at one point, but then just like that. I mean, how stupid. Just fell right into the trap. That is why it is so important for us to be in God's Word every day. Every day. Five minutes a day, that's the minimum. That's what I ask everybody. Be in God's Word every day. God's Word daily will continue to align us in God's will. And wherever God's Word is, His Spirit is is at work. It's, it's a guarantee. Allow the Spirit of God to work in your life every day. Just for a few minutes. That's what you got. Be in God's Word. The second thing we learn about misplaced things is that it is tough to fix. It's really tough to fix. It's so hard. Not only do you have to resist temptation, but you have to start new habits. And it is tough to teach an old dog new tricks. It is. It's so hard to form new habits. And that is why, for this step, I would beg and I would plead with you, uh, to bring people into your life who are walking with God, who are following Jesus. It's so important. The people who you allow into your circle, the people you allow to speak into your life, have such a strong influence. And that's why I talk so much about life groups. Why having that group of people, a group of friends doing life together. Yeah, we've got... I got friends at work. I got friends here. I got friends back in Tennessee. I got great. But to have friends here in our church, walking together, following the Lord, doing the best that we can. Uh, you know, I say uh, going to church is so important because, uh, well, no number of reasons. <laughs> but at this point, because if I'm surrounded by my fellow sheep, if you will. Right? We're this big herd of sheep. If I'm surrounded by them, when, not if, but when there, a time comes in my life, whether it's loss of a loved one, illness, bad diagnosis, relationship trouble, when I lose sight of the Good Shepherd, I am so surrounded by my fellow sheep that I can't wander too far off. Even when I can't see the shepherd, they can. And if I stay with them, right, I know at least I'm moving in the right direction. Maybe I can't see more than one, two steps in front of me, but I know we're still moving in the right direction. So important, it's, and it's tough. But that's why God gave us each other. And the third thing that we can learn from this little passage is that it is worth the work. It's absolutely worth the hard work. It's easy. It's easy to misplace our priorities. And it's hard to fix it. But when you get them right, when you are freed from the stress that all those trivial things give you, and, and you're, you live in the freedom of God's grace and His love, it empowers you. It, it, it fills you with joy. 
It gives you a peace that passes all human understanding. Like, why aren't you worried about the stock market? Why aren't you worried about the politics of the system? Why aren't you worried about the... So I've got the peace of God. That's the most important thing. If you want to see someone who really kept his priorities in order, well, I guess we look at it to Jesus. It says, when, he, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, when it was time for him to be crucified for our sins, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He was not distracted by anything. He knew what was at stake. He knew what his mission was, and his mission was going to be completed in Jerusalem. And he set his face, he focused on the most important thing for him, the mission for his life. And it was worth it for him. You and me, we are worth it to Jesus. To die for our sins. Of course, to rise for our eternal life. So I pray, I pray that we will all keep the big things big, and the small things, small. Amen? Now, if you'll bear with me one more minute. This is a trivial versus the important things in our own personal journeys and our spiritual walk. I'd like to talk about this topic on a family level, on a congregation level. Have you ever heard of Makani Yezu? No? I'm surprised. Makani Yezu is the Lutheran church in Ethiopia. Makani Yezu is the largest Lutheran church body in the world. 8.3 million members. Makani Yezu is the fastest growing Lutheran church body in the world. 500,000 new members last year. Makani Yezu. How do they do that? How's that even possible? Makani Yezu is wholeheartedly devoted to one thing. Reaching the lost with the only hope of the world. Jesus. They keep the main thing, the main thing. What do they do? Well, they go out and they plant new churches in villages and areas of the cities. And it only takes a spark to light a fire. When one, two, three, four, a dozen people come and they hear this good news of Jesus Christ, it changes their life. When they experience the love of God for the first time, it is so exciting. They can't wait to go and tell their family, to tell their neighbors, and to invite them to come and hear for themselves. Jesus, this Jesus, he's changed my life. Come and see. Just come and see for yourself. You be the judge. Jesus will change your life too. The main thing, the main thing. It's like... The church in America today is standing still and Mikani Yezu is running at a full-out sprint. So what about us? Even in the life of a church family, the devil is at work. There are temptations lurking around every corner for us to make the trivial things the most important things rather than what do you think? God? His mission? 
What's God's mission for us? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them. The main thing, the main thing. The big thing's big, the small thing's small. We're doing, uh, we're kind of beginning this process of a long-range plan, a strategic ministry plan. You might hear me say the word SMP. That's what that would mean if you hear that. Uh, I think that there's a survey that's going to be coming out to everybody. So I hope that, uh, I haven't looked at it yet, but I hope you'll uh, get a chance to fill that out and send it back in. And I hope that you'll look at the survey through the lens of God's mission for us, not maybe simply our own maybe personal comforts or trivial things. Well, thank God that we have a Savior who is wholeheartedly devoted to us. I pray that we will put our trust in Him, the one who died and rose and lives and reigns. Amen? Amen.